Our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. Connecting Highline and our region. Share your story. Our Highline Voices, history, cultural heritage, art, performances, contemporary, pop culture. We are very motivated to provide a vibrant community museum and authentic social gathering place. It truly takes a village to raise a museum. Despite the challenges, our daily inspiration is our eagerness to build a stronger and more connected community. This museum is from the community to the community. Our passion is for our visitors to have access to a broad spectrum of information sources and cultural perspectives. Our Highline Voices. Hi everyone, my name is Nancy, I'm the director of the Highland Heritage Museum and welcome back. Uh, today uh, we have a very beautiful, special guest. I do say that, um, that everyone is special because that is true, everyone is, but in this case we got this beautiful girl or woman who is doing an amazing work and I'm just proud uh, um, of her, even as a person outside of her environment, but just as a person. And then hopefully you will be able to enjoy just this interview, just to get to know her a little bit more and, and the work that she's working. And so uh, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to let Leslie introduce herself, and then she's going to be sharing a little bit more about us. So Leslie, thank you so much for joining us today. Are we excited? And I'm just going to let you in, just just introduce yourself and then just share a little bit about who you are, and then we take it from there. That's okay. Cool. Well, first of all, thank you so much for asking me to be here. I'm very excited to be able to talk to you and share my story um, because it is something that uh, carries me through the work that I do in my personal life as well. So I am Leslie Coney. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, um, but I'm currently here in Washington as a third year PhD candidate in um, human-centered design and engineering at the University of Washington. And um, the work that I do there is around Black maternal health. And um, my focus is primarily on how community-based organizations and Black birthing people um, use technology to support uh, Black birthing people through their pregnancy and postpartum journeys. And so um, my connection to uh, the Highline area is that I recently received a grant to work with BlackBerry, which is a black owned doula center in the area. Um, and I'm super excited about that project um, because I think the community aspect of research is very important to me. So to have the opportunity to work with a community organization that's based here in Washington state and that has a um, particular focus on serving black birthing people. Um, I'm really excited to get that work started next quarter. Um, and then a little bit more about my background. I also graduated from Howard for undergrad and I did computer science there. And so I had the like very technical background, but um, I learned about human computer interaction or HCI when I was a sophomore at Howard. And it really changed the trajectory of like what I wanted to put my um skills and efforts towards and my focus on. Um, and so moving to the HCDE program for graduate studies uh, is more so about like taking that technical aspect and being more critical of it and understanding like how technology impacts people and communities and society as a whole and how those impacts vary across different identities. Oh, like I say, you, uh, I mean, all of you and for many different reasons. One is that uh, yes, you do have that technological background and the knowledge, but then you tap it into a really sensitive topic. You mm -hmm. address in a very, um, all, all the way from ethically to, I don't know, to a more human level, you really tap into the human condition and what it means to like all of us, you know, all of us came from a mom and then mm -hmm. what it means to be, um, in that process and know, knowing that not everyone gets the same treatment, not everyone gets the same um, care uh, mm -hmm. and not everyone just basically, yeah, gets the same treatment. And so why, why that is specific topic? Why is that a specific uh, project? And I mean, I just want to know about if it is a passion behind or if it's something that taught you and you saw something or something that you truly believe that, well, we all should be truly believing that that's the right thing to know regardless. But 
I want to know a little bit more about behind the, the heart behind this project. Yes. So um, I actually share this story a lot because it is it definitely was a a pivotal point in my decision making for like even going to graduate school in the first place. Um, and so in my junior year of undergrad, I participated in a, a four week data science and machine learning uh, program abroad. And so while I was there, we spent the first three weeks um, working on uh, learning like data science and machine learning curriculum, very fast paced, because of course we only had the three weeks over spring, over winter break. And um, the last week, the fourth week was dedicated to a hackathon, which is basically just an event for participants to showcase their technical skills, but around a real world issue. And so um, the team that I had during that hackathon space, we really wanted to choose a uh, a societal issue that was uh, tangible, that like was meaningful to us and that we truly believed in the mission of addressing. And so while we were looking for what that thing was, we came across Serena Williams' birthing story. And um, I think uh, more people are familiar about it now, but she had a negative birthing experience that could have ultimately led to her death. And I think for me, what ran through my head in that moment, um, listening to her story and doing more research about it, is if Serena Williams <laughs> could have issues or complications or feel unheard during her birthing experience, what are everyday women and birthing people experiencing? Um, and so that caused me to look more in depth about like maternal mortality rates. And um, while I know like, innately that uh, Black women are treated differently and like worse in most cases than other people when it comes to these larger systems, societal systems. I did not know the st statistics that Black women are two to three times more likely to die during childbirth than white women. And even more alarming statistics like um, education didn't necessarily have a factor. And so that ranged across women who had Black women who had graduate degrees. Um, they were still having these terrible experiences. And so uh, for me in that moment, um, while we were working on that project, a participant from the country that we were in was coming around to help people. And he asked us like, in a hostile tone, why are you only focused on black mothers? Why are you not looking at white mothers too? And so at the time I had just recently turned 20 years old. Um, I wasn't as level headed or even like to the level of articulation that I am now. And all I knew is that the question really upset me. And so I stepped away from my group. I called my mom. Like I just was, I told like the um, person who was over the program um, that I was just really offended by this question. And so uh, my research in the program and that anger that I felt when that question was posed to me made me feel like one, Black maternal health is is definitely a, a big and important enough issue for me to tackle in dissertation, in a dissertation. And two, um, I really wanted to use my time in my doctoral studies to find a way to articulate why that question upset me. And so um, I'm still on a journey to that, like really articulating why the question upset me and um, really just understanding why do people have uh, such a resistance to like only looking at marginalized communities when it comes to research or focusing on certain problems. Um, I don't think that's a problem. And I'm, I'm very uh, strong on my stance of like only working with Black birthing people. And obviously those people range from like different abilities, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different um, geographic locations, but um, I am very strong on a stance about only working with Black birthing people because for me, um, they have been neglected for far too long. And so uh, me deciding to dedicate my studies to them is not to be exclusionary to other um, identities or races, uh, but more so to uplift their stories, their experiences, their needs and desires um, throughout pregnancy and postpartum. So that is my why. Um, I also feel like I have a god sister who passed away when I was nine. And um, it's like the first and only to this point, like family member 
whose death has like affected me to the way that it did. And um, she passed while she was pregnant. And so I think some of these things have like been leading me up to this point of like working in the birthing community and supporting black mothers and birthing people through their pregnancy and postpartum journeys. And the technical piece is because that's what my undergraduate training was in. Yeah, I think that a little bit of everything. I mean, having that experience firsthand, even if you're young, I think that that true will give you an, uh, you know, it's an impactful event for you, so not just you, anyone around you. Um, and then um, there, there are a lot of comments that I have received throughout the years is when we do a very specific programming, oh, Spanish speaking only, oh, things like that. Exactly. It's the same reaction as, oh, why just in Spanish? Why in this and that? And 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 so I, I truly get what you're saying. As people coming coming to you, it's like, oh, why are you doing this? But I think that you just say it correctly that um the lack of information of just that area is real. And so why not? Because it's not it's not much information about that. So yeah. I think it's it is is the same answer. It's, it answers the question as to why because there's no research done on that area and why that is because it's not been addressed before mm -hmm. and so um the same thing when when, when we do some spanish-speaking programs you know it's like because we haven't our communities which speak only in spanish have not had that many experiences in the community that allows them to do that mm -hmm. um and so no i, I get the idea of Diving into topics that are not being fully researched or, or covered or addressed, um, I think that once again you're tapping into the human condition of of what are the needs and how do we make that distinction yeah. um, medically. To me, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, I have my own pregnancy. I got my own issues, and yeah. and it was very very tough. And I can imagine. Um, I guess I can imagine. I can imagine uh, when you're already in a vulnerable position as a mom, being being afraid of your child that you're carrying, and then on top of it, had to deal with issues that you were not expecting to deal with when you taking care of that. I mean, only unless you know somebody, there's not really that reference as you when you go into those areas and like, oh my goodness, this is something I was not expecting. I was not expecting to get this pushback. I was not expecting to get this treatment or I wasn't expecting to be treated like this um and so is I, I think that um the more research more knowledge more understanding of the issues and, and then really trying to say okay here are the situations now what do we do with it and then I think that you're working through that you're working on on seeing or trying to capture different angles and levels of what you're referring to yeah. um so with with so I know that the reason why we contact you in the first place, because you're going to be giving a presentation. By the time of this interview, by the time everyone is listening to it, probably, I don't know if they, the presentation that we're hosting here will be already passed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but um, you are part of the panel that we are presenting. Yeah. And um, we're going to be tapping into this, and it's going to be more about celebrating, um, well, you know, warm, um, ah, Women's History Month. And so, you know, the, all of us are what makes us us. us and then the, they, and in your case, is addressing motherhood, yeah. which is a strong, powerful uh, topic. On on the aspect of, of, you know, when we met you, or when I met you, when we contacted you, it was because we saw you in an article. Uh, we saw you in this magazine, and then it just right away blows away that you were young and then you were doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you don't mind to talk a little bit about the article or the, the funding that you got and why you got that funding. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it will be more about um, the work that you actually do in Iberian in, or in the mm -hmm. area. And yeah. then um, it's just like, okay, so if anyone has questions, pretend I'm, I'm a mom mm -hmm. and I want to learn more about that. Share resources, share, I mean, feel free. Like I say, this is your space. Okay. Uh, and just pretend that um, I'm, a mom when I'm pregnant, I'm a scare mm -hmm. and I'm nervous and um, I don't know what to do. Okay. Um, so as far as the article that you all um, saw me in, I believe it was for the Google Health Equity Grant. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay. So um, I did receive a, a Google Health Equity Award in, I believe it was November of 2022. And uh, that proposal that I wrote was uh, a project that wanted to understand uh, Black birthing people's experiences using technology to access community-based resources. And so I think um, a lot of people automatically think about like, doctor visits and like seeing an OBGYN um, and like ultrasound appointments and those things. But uh, what I would really like to focus on in my research is how people also tap into their community assets to support them during pregnancy and postpartum and, and how they access those resources. And so um, that work I propose for it to take place in Atlanta um, because there is a higher uh, population of black people there. Um, so I did go to Atlanta last summer to uh, do that work. And I will say it was my first time leading a research project by myself. Um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And um, it wasn't necessarily the project didn't get to the point where I necessarily wanted it to be over the summer. Um, but we're going to also run a similar study here in Washington State. Um and so where BlackBerry comes in, uh, I think for me, I'm really interested in understanding like individual birthing person experiences um, when it comes to like accessing and using community resources or assets. Um, but for BlackBerry side, I'm also really interested in the ways that uh, community based organizations serving these black birthing people uh, use or can use technology to better support their service delivery. And so um, whether that's lifting a burden off of a birth worker or administrator at these organizations, or if it's a client facing um, application or resource um, that could help a Black birthing person be better connected to BlackBerry and their services. Um, those are kind of some of the things that we're brainstorming. And so um, I think for me, I want this uh, partnership with BlackBerry to be long term for the rest of my uh, dissertation work and uh, the important parts of that is like building genuine connections and so I actually went to visit Blackberry in their like brick and mortar um, location and it was a great time just sitting and talking to Jasmine Williams is the founder of Blackberry it was a really great time getting to sit down and talk to her um, about my work and just connect on a personal level um, and then also even thinking about because I'm a PhD student um, what does sustainability look like for this project even after I graduate? That's something that's really important to me. Um, and then the third thing that's really important in like these longer term research relationships that I would like to um, make sure is a part of my research practice is engaging a community in a way that's not academic. And so uh, there are also plans that I have for the Burian and broader communities for BlackBerry and I to partner on some community service events and be able to give back uh, to the community through some of the grant money that um, we've been awarded. So I'm really excited for uh, what's to come with the partnership with BlackBerry. I'm really excited about interfacing with the community, um, both for research and outside of research context. And um, yeah, I think like last summer, I just learned a lot. Like that was my first big grant and I learned a lot about like the research proce process. And um, I think for me, it's like when I'm in classes for my doctoral studies, you learn how to do like research methods and you learn how to like um, do things. But what I was struggling with is like the administrative side, like that's something you kind of learn on the way. So even just like keeping track of everything and like you need a study design, you need IRB, you need to make this survey, you need to make this recruitment flyer. Um, and I was handling all of those things on my own. And so uh, I think one, I learned a lot from that experience handling on my own, but I'm really excited to have like a team of people um, in this partnership with BlackBerry to just go further and do bigger things, have like grander ideas and hopefully um, leave an impact that will last beyond my time physically here in Washington. Yeah, no, this is a beautiful. I love, I love how you are not only thinking it as a project, you know, mm -hmm. a project that is a school project that that is, uh, or a grant project or a community project that has a beginning of the end, an expiration date. To that, it seems like you 
are looking at um, something that you can grow and expand and then and also continue to be, like you said, sustainable. And so that is great. And then the fact to know that uh, Blackberry is here in Berrien um, and is so hyper local and yeah. to the work that we do too, um, meaning like here in the community, all of us in one way or another trying to do the best that we can to serve the community. But in your case, uh, you provide tools and the tools, tools yeah. to to think about how, what else can you do? What else can, you know, can it be expanded, expand on this really critical topic, mm -hmm. the motherhood. Okay, let, I'm gonna, I don't know. I, I don't, I know that I did not uh, share this question with you because mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep it simple. You don't have to answer it, but it's just, once again, I, I, I wanna get more of the human element. I don't wanna go too technical on, 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 on on our audience, but like more about you and, and the heart behind it. And I know that you already shared a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. But motherhood, what is motherhood to you? Oh, uh, I know you don't have to answer. It just came out really organic. And maybe yeah. I'm gonna ask you something different. And if you want to answer later on, you can answer that one. Is that um the I think that the studies that you have done would very specific demographics are very crucial and needed. Um, I think that when you combine many different uh, demographics all at once, it gets a lot of information gets lost. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can just grab that that data and then comparing it to the rest of what is out there um, and then really see that comparison. Um, the, the, you know, they're organically, I have issues with doctors. In general, I just have issues with doctors, period. Um, I was looking at, there's this show on Netflix, it's called uh, Diagnosed. And mm -hmm. it just talks about, you know, the, you know, the frustration that people feel with doctors in general, too, and what that is. And so it's very interesting to really tap into that research that you're doing to make the distinction between, okay, this is uh, affecting more of this demographic, even though an average population people normally have not, I'm not saying, and I'll make a disclaimer, I'm not saying everyone has issues with doctors, but I do know that there is a factor there where people do get frustrated when when they're seeking more than one or two or three options or whatever that is. And that show exists because of that. It's just that element. But having that um, specific demographic, I think is crucial. I think we need to know what, what the issues are and really seeing them. It's almost like a going through a microscope. Okay, let's go really down. Let's go deep into all the known factors that we have not discovered. Have you been surprised so far of the findings that, you, that, that you've been collecting? Yeah, so um, uh, I'll go back to the what is motherhood question and then I'll answer about the findings. Um, I think uh, similar to the panelists for next week were posed the question like what is womanhood or what does it mean to be a woman and um I didn't have maybe if you asked me in like high school I may have had a a straightforward answer for that um but I think for me that definition or ideal of what a woman is or what it means to be a woman or what womanhood is um it's constantly changing and I think part of that is unlearning uh, the definition of like what it means to be a woman and what it what womanhood looks like um, in a white patriarchal context. And so um, taking that back to motherhood, uh, I think there are some there's literature around like the black family unit and how different it is from a white family unit um, and even thinking about like uh in the black family unit uh so many times people call like their mom's best friend from college their auntie we're not blood related but that's my auntie um i have aunties like that i have uncles like that friends that my dad has since college they're my uncles um my godmother something happens to my parents like they're meant to take me under their wing um and granted i'm an adult now but i still would see them as mother figures and so um, I've recently read something about like what it means to mother as a verb um, is more about nurturance and care and consideration for another life. And so that's whether that's biologically your child, whether you um, physically gave birth to them or not, um, those things don't 
confine what motherhood is. And I think like thinking through a very whitewashed lens, we can get caught up in like this very narrow definition of what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a mother or motherhood. And I also will preface this by saying I'm not a mother yet. I desire to be one um, in the future, but I am not there yet. And so um, I think this is this answer is definitely from the readings that I've done. A lot of my work is like um, grounded in Black feminist thought. And that is very important for like, uh, you know, just breaking down these confines that uh, society, particularly like American society has put on um, some of these definitions for um, womanhood and motherhood. And um, also just self-reflection to with my own relationship with the women in my life who I consider to be um, mother figures, my own mother, my grandmother, um, and even like the aunties that I was telling you about, like they may not be blood related, but there are definitely people I know I can call um, and they will love on me and care for me the same way my mother would. And so my biological mother would. And so I think, um, yeah, I would say that definition is, is very fluid for me. And I think, uh, especially in the Black community, if we really just take time to reflect on the ways we uh, take on people as family, even though they may not biologically be our family, that is a superpower to me. Um, and as does everything, it definitely goes back to slavery. Like, you may not have been able to be with your biological children. Maybe they were sold away or killed or anything else. Um, but there are people who took care of those children like they were their own if you weren't there for them. Um, or people who took care of you like they were their own if you had got moved away from your family. And so I think that's one of the strengths of the Black community, um, that we can have this fluid definition of what familyhood, what parenthood, what family is, what parenthood looks like. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll, I'll have a even grander perspective when I become a parent of my uh, own children. But um, I would say now that's kind of where I am with what I believe motherhood or, or parenthood is. And then as far as any surprising, any surprising uh, findings, I think very early, I mentioned this earlier, like so, uh, education level not necessarily having a factor on outcomes really surprised me um, because I think, especially in this country, like education, education, education is really um, pressed and even outside of like education becoming uh, less affordable, the people who are pursuing that higher education may think that like, oh, they're equipping themselves with like the tools and resources to support themselves and advocate for themselves. But when you sit and think about it, it's like, there are moments and instances where like racism and like the way racism is embedded in our system, it's just, it just overpowers that work. Like regardless if you, I'm about to have a PhD um, and even through like the stuff that I've been reading, work that I've been doing, I'm still nervous to give birth. Like, um, and I, I'm, I would consider myself as somebody who is like semi in this space. So I may know of more resources than other people might. And I'm still concerned for my life when I go give birth. Um, and so that was one interesting finding for me is that like education level doesn't necessarily, um, or even status. Like I think my introduction to the Black maternal mortality crisis was Serena Williams story. And I'm like, immediately off back if somebody with Serena Williams status money like talent education could possibly be and resources could possibly be in a situation like this what does that mean for people with less resources or less education or um lower finances and so um yeah that was like a, a major <laughs> big interesting finding for me uh another thing that I'm noticing uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily interesting because like you kind of know this, but you don't 100% see how it plays out all the time. But it's the way that policy affects um, maternal health and especially across um, like state and federal regulations. And so uh, that is something that I want to be more involved in when I graduate is like the politics of um, birthing and the way that it's policed in this country. 
and also thinking through like um, the ways community organizations can um, support birthing people on a larger scale um, that is uh, complementary to that clinical care that people typically go for. Um, and so for me, I, I think it's, I think that process of like uh, pregnancy and postpartum and even contraception even contraception, um, conception, I'm sorry, if you're uh, going through avenues such as like IVF, um, I think those things are uh, events in life that could benefit from um, the collaboration and communication of clinical institutions and community organizations. So um, yeah, I think the politics of everything also surprised me a bit um, because you definitely will see findings that vary across states and it's like you know we you we think we're all under this like one bucket of like you know United States of America but people are also having very different experiences across states as well um so I think that would be something interesting for me to delve into more when I graduate yeah no I two different things um one is um that I love asking questions about terminology because when it is part of a discussion, yeah. everyone has different interpretations. Yeah. And I'm learning that with my 17 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. Like she I will will be arguing about something and I'm like, wait a second, what do you what do you think I mean when I say this term? And her interpretation is completely different than I am. And we are using one. And so I'm learning that um in past interviews, you're gonna see that, like when I say, "Okay, you're using this term sustainability. What does that mean?" As an immigrant and as a person with a second language, it took me years to understand that term, and so it's just an idea, right? Oh, this, this, uh, what, what home? Another question that people get is like, "Whoa, this what is home to you?" You know, it's like it's all the basic, and so mm -hmm. they will be used in everyday conversations with this basic terminology. But when you're having a dialogue. And then the interpretation of those words are different. Then the context of the dialogues gets it, it gets in that different direction. Yeah. And so yeah, this that's the reason why I'm not just you and just general, you know, just asking those so we can get a context. Okay, what is the angle? And the answers that you provided, I just love it. I love, I love how you uh take that and and then provide it at different angles and levels of what that word means to you and why. And, and also even the hesitation, why the hesitation. So right that alone allows for more understanding, allows uh, to have a richer dialogue mm -hmm. because it's all many layers. And, and, and so to me, it, this is just perfect. And, and so thank you for answering that question. And going back to the surprises, I think that uh, those are the areas that we need to grow, we need to involve, we need to dive in. I think those are the areas that, you know, there's like an opportunities for you to say, hey, not just you, but like anyone who's inspired by the work that you do and want to be part of that too. Like, okay, yeah, maybe we can talk about this stale, federal level issues and we can address it this way. And so now I'm just so happy that you're able to vocalize and you're so Thank articulate. You. And so I appreciate that. Um, we got five minutes left. And so mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we capturing something else that you want to say. So feel free. You got any comments you can share, resources, yeah. anything you would like to share? Um, I would say that, and I, I think I, I mentioned this on our call, like in preparation for the panel. Um, I really just want to drive home the point of like how important community is. And um, when I moved to Seattle, I actually moved from Washington, D.C., um, or that was where I was familiar with prior to the pandemic um, because that's where I went to undergrad. And so I moved here not knowing a single person. Um, I had talked to one other person who's currently in my program, another black man in my program um, on like LinkedIn. And we got on maybe a couple Zoom calls uh, to like better understand the environment of the department and like the environment of Seattle and like just Washington state as a whole. And like the transition I was up against. And so coming here and not knowing a single person, uh, while it was a huge challenge for me, I would say the community that I've built here, I'm not even talking about like community, extended community that I have back home in Chicago, a community that I have that came through my college years and experiences. Um, but the 
community that I've built that's physically here in Seattle um, has truly sustained me in my almost three years of, of being here. Um, and so I think that's just, and also community service. I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and community service is like one of our pillars. And um, that is something that's been like instilled in me even before joining that organization, um, even before college. And so I think like being uh, in community with one another and being of service to the community that you're in, um, it's just very important. And like you said, like people have different definitions of home. Um, community is wherever I'm at. So uh, I still support community efforts back home in Chicago. Um, but because this is where I'm physically at, this is where I'm, uh, you know, living at. I have all this time at. I'm growing in this space, like early 20s. Uh, I want to make sure I'm pouring into this community as well. So uh, it's been really fun to see how my community has developed over time here. Um, I love the fact that uh, the people that I've met and made connections with here will continue to be in my life beyond my time physically here. Um, and that's what's like most important to me. Um, and so, yeah, I just would urge people listening to really get involved in your community uh, community. Um, if that's too large of a step to start with, uh, think about like how you're fostering community among your friends and family that you already do have and just see how your life changes. No, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, the opportunity for people to get to know, to know you a little bit more, to understand about the project that you're working on, the importance of that, and mm -hmm. then providing a hope, hope that there's, there are the people like you looking at different options and then that you're pushing and you're working and then that you're inspiring. So no, we need more, more, more like you that, that inspires and brings the light into the space and into the community growth. And, and, and more than anything, just really, like you said, serve the community. Mm -hmm. And so Leslie, once again, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity thank to, you to for get to know me. you. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully, um, like I said, um, I, no, I'm not so sure what comes first. You interview the panel, but either way, <laughs> We're going to be able to to present um, your voice here digitally mm -hmm. on the radio and then on top of it on the presentation in real life and at the okay. on site. So this is great. Yeah. So everyone, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And once again, thank you for, for coming and until next time. Thank you. Our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. We envision ourselves sitting at a round table where no one is the leader and stories are heard respectfully, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, disabilities, or ethnicity. We want to embrace our differences and similarities. We are creating a place where visitors can connect with the stories and each other. Our mission is we collect, preserve, and tell the stories of the Highline region and its people. We want to extend our mission outside the walls of the museum. Our Highline Voices represents us all, honoring our past, celebrating our present, and uniting to cultivate our future. This project allows us to reach out to demographics who might be unable to visit the museum. People with disabilities, low-income families, people who don't trust museums, and more. In partnership, we are launching a locally programmed new radio station at the museum featuring recorded and live Highline's heritage, history, culture, arts, and more. Are you interested in sharing your story? Email director at highlinemuseum.org. <laughs>